So welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with another podcast, What's Going On in Pop Culture Right Now. we got a good pod this week, of course, reacting to the 2024 Oscars, who won, who didn't win, takeaways from that. Ariana Grande gave us her seventh album, Eternal Sunshine. It's a sonic change for her, but one I think is pretty good. we got to talk about that. HBO's new miniseries starring Kate Winslet, The Regime, is out. Had to talk about that. And then not one, but two Chinese blockbuster films from the Lunar New Year box office last month have both released in the U.S. Those would be YOLO and Zhang Yimou's Article 20. Had to talk about both of those as well. So make sure you subscribe, youtube.com plus nostalgia pod. See the links below, linktree.com plus nostalgia pod, the best of 2024 Spotify playlist. Get all of that. Let me know what's good and let's get into it. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with my reaction to the 2024 Oscars. We finally got them, did my predictions, reacted to the nominations. The Oscars finally happened. And unsurprisingly, Oppenheimer came out on top, winning seven awards off its 13 nominations, followed by Poor Things winning four times, The Zone of Interest winning twice, and several other movies winning once. Going to go through all the winners, going to go through the takeaways, what stood out most about what happened. But overall, I'd say it's a pretty good telecast. Like this, I think, is one of the strongest, most tightly produced Oscar shows we've gotten some time. Part of that. Uh, coming kind of under the runtime, running more efficiently than we've had in the past. Of course, a lot big talking point with the 2024 Oscars with the fact that it was starting early and combining that with daylight savings time was a bit of a different vibe. But more than anything, I think the fact that this movie had genuine popular films in true genuine contention, namely, of course, Oppenheimer and Barbie, really leading to, I think, genuine interest from a lot of people with this show. You know, just not beyond people like myself that are going to watch it either way, that are hardcore film fans, right? Jimmy Kimmel doing well once again in his fourth time hosting. Also, we got a taste of maybe what is to come. John Mulaney presenting one of the awards. He's, I think, hotly tipped to be a future host. I think he would be amazing. So we'll see about that. You know, Kimmel has wanted to, in some respects, retire from this. So that'd be a fun passing of the torch. But yeah, I think uh, overall... One really strong takeaway that I think we should go with how the awards happened was the international membership of the Film Academy that we talk about often when predicting nominations specifically, that is a very strong like, certified thing. The Zone of Interest winning two, two awards, namely the second award it wins. Best International Feature was a given, but it also won Best Sound, beating Oppenheimer in that category. Anatomy of a Fall winning Best Original Screenplay, of course, a movie from France. Godzilla Minus One, winning Best Visual Effects, defying some of the conventional wisdom with the precursor award, suggesting the creator would, in fact, win. Very happy with Godzilla getting that dub, of course. Also, of course, probably the most notable of all with this, Studio Ghibli's The Boy and the Heron, winning Best Animated Feature, defeating Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, despite the fact that all the predicting, for the most part, in terms of precursors, was suggesting Spider-Man would win. All that combined together with, of course, Justin Trier being nominated for Best Director, the trends we've seen in the past with other international faces getting into Best Director, like Ruke Hamaguchi, Bong Joon-ho, Paul Pawlikowski, Thomas Vinterberg, it just continues to... Uh, circle us in on the fact that the international aspect of the film academy is quite strong. And to me, this is a great thing because film has never been more global, never been more accessible than it is at this very moment. So we should honor that. And if we're a little less Hollywood in terms of what we nominate and what wins, I think that's a good thing. And again, all the international movies that won and were nominated this year are great. So I think everybody wins. Kind of related to that, of course, would be Yorgos Lanthimos, nominated for Best Director, and his film Poor Things is the third most nominated film, second uh, most winningest film. And Yorgos, of course, has a track record at the Oscars, but he continues this trend. And I think my other big takeaway related, of course, is that Poor Things, which had just a stronger night than was to be expected, you know, winning four times. And a lot of the awards that Poor Things won, I had predicting Barbie would won, but Poor Things kind of, you know, won that battle each and every time, you know, winning for costume design, winning for production design, also winning for makeup and hairstyling award tip to go to Maestro, Maestro going home empty handed. Also going home empty handed was Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, now the third film from Marty to go 0 for 10 at the Oscars. What a tough beat. 
And of course, Killers won 04 because Lily Gladstone did not win Best Actress. Of course, that went to Emma Stone for Poor Things, again, contributing to the strong night for Poor Things. And that was, of course, a kind of a dead heat race head to head. They had split up all the precursor wins. So it was really hard to get a feel of exactly where it was going to go. I had picked Gladstone. Stone gets the win, her second Best Actress win, really getting her into you know, historic company, especially given her still young age. So she's just one of our uh, standout movie stars, obviously. And it's certainly a well-deserved win. But yeah, big night for poor things. Big night for the international films in general. And of course, a big night for Oppenheimer, unsurprisingly. Winning picture, director, supporting actor, cinematography, editing, score. Robert Dine Jr. giving a great speech for supporting actor, an awesome win from him. Christopher Nolan finally being certified at the Academy with his first Best Director win and winning for Best Picture, which also happened to be one of the highest grossing films of the year. And it's kind of like, this is the Oppenheimer Oscars, but it's really just a nice capper on just the amazingness that was Oppenheimer's success and Barbenheimer's success with Oppenheimer grossing over $950 million as a three-hour R-rated biopic. Like, again, it cannot be overstated, the success of that movie in 2023. Godzilla Minus One is just an epic win for best visual effects because of the the, the slight budget that that film had and what it was able to achieve with less. It's just an amazing thing, and I hope people take lessons from that movie as well as the creator in terms of what can be achieved visually when you have real you know, visionaries that are really thoughtful in their logistical planning when it comes to making a movie. Hopefully, those lessons can be learned, and some of these ballooning blockbuster uh, budgets that we see sometimes can come down. So when the movie maybe isn't as successful as you hope, it's not this back-breaking, debt-inducing loss for the studio. I'm really happy that The Boy and the Heron won Best Animated Feature because, you know, Spider-Man Across the uh, Spider-Verse, you know, the the first Spider-Verse film, already won this award. They're going to make two more Spider-Verse films as well as a spin-off, I believe, about Spider-Gwen. So there's more t- chances to win again. But, you know, The Boy and the Heron was such a capstone film, it was so referential to the past work of Hayao Miyazaki at Studio Ghibli, that getting Hayao a second Oscar win, of course, after Spirited Away, getting that second win for a movie like The Boy and the Heron, which felt so, you know, final as a piece of work, even if it might not actually be Ohio's final movie it just felt right to me like a really like kind of just uh type of win versus you know the middle spider-verse movie in like the three or four movies they're gonna make so i think that was super super great um billy eilish wins best original song as expected for what was i made for and yet what was the scene stealing song performance at the oscars in 2024 of course ryan gosling and the rest of the ken's doing I'm Just Ken, because I'm Just Ken was the song that should have won this award. Everyone's been saying it, but it's actually a moment in the movie itself that's memorable and meaningful, and we usually usually don't get that with Best Original Song nominees and winners. That's just usually not the types of songs that are in movies, so when you actually have a song like that, frankly, it should be nominated, and it should win. So it's kind of a bit of a bummer that Billie Eilish in her just immense awards popularity, whatever the award show is, uh, kind of just pushed through. Frankly, Dua Lipa's Dance the Night, being on the telecast but not nominated, also was noticeable to me. Just some stats here. Oppenheimer is actually the third highest grossing film to ever win, topped only by Titanic and Lord of the Rings The Return of the King, which of course will make it the highest grossing Best Picture winner in the last two decades. In terms of people that weren't there, Wes Anderson won for live action short for the wonderful story of Henry Sugar, but he wasn't there because he's actually filming over in Europe. It was like day one or two. Honestly, they really couldn't, you know, switch the production just a few days. Like, nonetheless, understandable excuse. What's not an understandable excuse and, and just an L is Leonardo DiCaprio not being there to support Killers of the Flower Moon, to support Lily Gladstone, someone he campaigned for basically the entire season. Of course, Leo didn't end up getting nominated himself and not going. Kind of reminds me of Tom Cruise and James Cameron skipping last year. Um, it's it just it's just lame and kind of in poor taste. And usually Leo's kind of above something like that. You expect it more from someone like Cruise or Cameron. So yeah, in conclusion, you, we had a great movie year capped with a great Oscars. It's what we want. And I think all eyes now will be on what the 2025 Oscars are going to be like because it's looking to be a much slater movie slate in 
part and parcel because of the Hollywood strikes delaying some movies, preventing some movies from finishing production, thus leading to delays, et cetera, et cetera. You, we know the story. And we're certainly seeing that on the schedule with the blockbuster front. But lest we forget, a lot of movies that get nominated, whether it's a Past Lives, whether it's Anatomy of a Fall, and Everything Everywhere All at Once, whatever it might be, a lot of movies are not on the Oscar radar, you know, March of the previous year. So things will bubble up, especially on the international front, as we can bank on at this point. And I won't be shocked if there's a lot of critical darlings uh, still really populating a deep Oscar year. But the question will be if there's a big movie, again, that can push through. You know, I think Dune Part 2 is probably going to be that movie, given how many nominations the first film got. So right now, at this very moment, you would put Dune Part 2 kind of up there as a one of, if not the contender for next year. Of course, it's so early to say. But that's where we're at. Let me know. How'd you feel about the 2024 Oscars? How'd you do with your predictions? I think I got five wrong, so I did like, you know, decent year, but I underestimated poor things. That's really how I lost a lot of these. But yeah, how did you feel about these Oscars? What do you want to see next year at the Oscars? Do you want John Mulaney, the host? Let me know. And for more awards predictions, including the Oscars, the Grammys, and the Emmys, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of The Regime, the new HBO miniseries starring Kate Winslet. I was anticipating The Regime, or at least looking forward to checking it out, because, of course, Kate Winslet's last series on HBO was, of course, Mayor of Easttown Emmy Award winning series, a political satire series such as The Regime, in which Kay Winslet once again is the star, sounds sounds appealing, sounds interesting. So I was, you know, looking forward to it. Also in the cast, we have Andrea Riseborough coming off, of course, her surprise Oscar nomination for Two Leslie two years ago. Also Matthias Schoenhart and a little bit of Hugh Grant, developed by Will Tracy, Succession alum, Menu, uh, script writer, Stephen Frears did some directing. All the parts are there. And yet, I have to say, the regime really left me cold as it began. It's only a six-episode miniseries, but I feel like I saw like most of the show in that first episode, and I just don't know if the regime is executing on an interesting enough level to really make me want to continue watching it, and that's despite the fact that it stars Kate Winslet. You know, I just think the central premise of Winslet playing this uh, dictator in a middle European country. I get all that. I get the obvious comparisons to Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump speaking to our current moment. I understand the reference points. Vernum, you know, cozying up to a violent uh, military type, uh, Zubak, played by Matthias Schoenhardt. Like, I understand what the show's doing and what's going to show, show us. I just don't think the comedy elements really landed enough as the series began. And I feel like I already can see exactly where the plot's going to go. Like obviously, things are going to go bad. Uh, Zubak's going to get more power, going to be very isolationist and very nationalist, and they're going to close off the country, leading to civil unrest, and Verna realizing she made some mistakes by the fact that she, maybe she was well-intentioned, despite her, her weird quirks that we see on display right away. I feel like I saw the whole show. I just don't know if there's enough comment here, enough interesting aspects of the satire. Like, just because it is satire and we understand the premise of the satire, it still has to land. It still has to make you feel something, whether that's great comedy or, like, really, I think, strong, you know, metaphor, whatever it might be. But this doesn't land the way Veep does. It doesn't have that humor element. And... I just don't know how cutthroat it's going to be either. So yeah, the regime kind of left me cold, not going to lie. And I'm not really sure if I'm going to finish watching the show. Riseborough's character, Agnes, kind of interesting. Don't really understand what her role is as the palace manager. Um, you know, is, is she a confidant? Is she a servant? It's kind of unclear. Uh, the aspect with her son and Vernum cozying up to him, manipulating him. Not really sure what, what's going on there. Schoenarts is Zubak. I don't know, kind of interesting. Like, he's a... Uh, pretty accomplished actor he's been a lot of stuff at this point but i also kind of feel like i understand what what's going on here he's kind of like a svengali i've seen this show actually compared to hbo's the idol which is not a comparison you want but the plotting between the uh influencing force on the lead character is pretty uh, easy to see the comparison we have all the advisors the cabinet members and in their obvious you know sycophant status like you, you can kind of see everything to the show and i think if, if there's the one thing you can latch on to and be invested in with this show the regime it's probably just watching kate winslet act because i do think she's doing a pretty good job 
as Vernum, as this very quirky, very insulated character. And like we have all these illusions to how she came to power and all that. But I just don't know if it's going to really amount to a whole lot. Like, you know, the PTV era has given us many movie stars on TV. So the novelty factor of watching a movie star lead a show that has long since passed. So just because it stars somebody famous doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to see it through anymore, even if it's on HBO. And yeah, the regime just didn't really grab me. I just don't think there's enough under the hood with this one, unfortunately. But let me know, are you feeling the regime more than me? Or are you kind of on the fence, such as I? Either way, let me know what's up. And for more TV reviews, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. What's up, Welcome back to Nostalgia? Dave here with a review of YOLO, the new comedy drama film from Jia Ling, the top female director in the Chinese film industry, you could say. This is her follow-up to her film Hi Mom from just a few years ago, which grossed over $848 million, primarily in China, making it the third highest grossing Chinese movie of all time. And it was the highest grossing film solo directed by a woman until Barbie, of course, came out last year. So a kind of upstart filmmaker turned commercial behemoth in China. And YOLO is her follow up. And this, of course, was the number one film at the Lunar New Year box office this past year, last month, which, of course, is a very lucrative time for Chinese film going, as people know. And... YOLO has already grossed nearly $500 million, again, primarily in China. And that thing that makes it like the 17th highest grossing uh, film of all time from China, with Hai Mom being number three. So again, like the accolades are quickly rising on the box office front. And YOLO got a small limited release in the U.S. from Sony Pictures International, about 200 theaters or so. And it actually grossed about 840000 Not bad for a small release, a small international film. This is based off the 2014 Japanese film, 100 Yen Love. It's set in the present day in Guangzhou. And it stars Ling as Du Leying. She's a 30-something college graduate who's very apathetic, very unmotivated. Uh, She's overweight. She isn't working. And her family doesn't know what to do. And she seemingly is not very happy. And it's basically a story about Lei Ying through kind of, you know, trials and tribulations, getting her act together, basically, despite being a bit of a people pleaser, someone who's been taken advantage of. And ultimately, it leads to this drastic physical transformation for star uh, Jia Ling, where she loses, you know, over 100 pounds, starts the film as a very overweight woman, leads to this scene where she's trained to be a boxer because uh, Du Lei Ying, her character, seems to find her center again when she starts uh, pursuing a boxing coach uh, in her local town, the coach paid by uh, Lei Jia Ying. And that box, you know, interest in the boxing coach leads to her genuinely using boxing as a way to motivate herself. And she, you know, over the course of over a year, gets herself into the, gets herself the chance to actually do a competitive boxing match, despite being obviously a, a newcomer to the sport. And, you know, this is a film that I'd say it, it starts pretty slow. I liked the end a lot more than the beginning, but the first act is ultimately a chore because Lei Ying, she's just not likable because she's so unmotivated, you know, living at home, uh, seemingly rude to her family that she's kind of living off of and around. I just didn't really like that persona. And I think it's it's weird because like the movie takes such strong tonal shifts where there's a lot of comedy elements in the beginning. But then once we get into that training montage stuff, there's a lot more seriousness to it. I mean, we, we literally get the Gonna Fly Now Rocky theme song regarding someone training for boxing. A little on the nose, I would say. But I think when it gets more dramatic, it's at least a little bit more interesting. I think the stuff with laying going on the reality TV program and how that's, how humiliating that is, thought that was pretty compelling. Um, you know, I think the issue that I think some people have had with this movie is what this film, what YOLO says about body image. You know, it takes a pretty negative stance on, you know, not having the traditional body image. It's a pretty traditional view on this sort of things, and it's presenting Lei Ying losing over 100 pounds uh, through boxing training as this very idealistic thing. 
And not that there's anything wrong with holding those ideals, but it seems to definitely be very focused on pushing that sort of body image, uh, which, of course, is not the most inclusive message, you know. Um, I can understand why that could bother some people. Um, I think it's at least kind of a bit heavy handed um, in how it holds it up as idealistic. But ultimately, I think the the training stuff is fun and uh, Jia Ling's chemistry with Lei Jian Yin, you know, once they start doing stuff at the boxing gym, it's pretty fun. There's probably just too many plot threads with this movie. Like, it runs pretty long. It's over two hours. Um, and again, that first act just felt so slow and stagnant. Um, maybe if it was trimmed a little bit, the tonal shifts wouldn't be nearly as obvious. Um, you know, who can say? But I thought the movie was interesting, but not quite my favorite of the Chinese blockbusters I've seen recently. I certainly was more partial to the number one movie at last year's Lunar New Year. Of course, Full River Red, I was much more interested in that. YOLO, though, seems to have really struck a chord, even if it has a bit of a polarizing message. But it was a solid effort, and I mean, Jeling, you know, she certainly is a interesting filmmaker, given her past accolades with her Fast 2 movie, so obviously she's someone who should be paid attention to, that much is clear. But yeah, let me know, how did you feel about YOLO? Did you like it more or less than me? Let me know. Of course, make sure you check out my review of another Lunar New Year release, Zhang Yimou's Article 20, and for more movie reviews, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Article 20, the new comedy drama film from Chinese filmmaking legend Zhang Yimou. This was one of the top releases at the Lunar New Year box office in China last month, the number three film of that corridor behind YOLO, which I've also reviewed. Check that out, as well as Pegasus 2. And this caps Zhang Yimou's sixth feature film in the last five years. The guy is in his early 70s, but still absolutely cooking. Just a prolific director and, of course, a legend in the Chinese filmmaking uh, history. We, we would know that well. I, of course, reviewed his two movies last year, Full River Red, which I liked quite a lot, the number one Chinese film of the year, and also Under the Light, which I did not like too much at all. So, of course, a new film from Yumo, I was going to check it out in Article 20, seems to have been, you know, pretty successful, grossing $320 million, uh, primarily in China, seemingly an adult audience with this film. Of course, this is a story about uh, our main character is a prosecutor in the legal system, and basically this is a film with a overall message about uh, the right to self-defense. That's where we uh, wind up. But along the way, it's a long movie, two hours, 20 minutes. Along the way, we spend a lot of time handling family and marriage dynamics. A lot of it starts out pro quite humorous as well. It's ultimately a movie that takes some pretty stark tonal shifts where a lot of this stuff is presented pretty uh, lightly, like as a moment of levity early on. And the movie slowly gets heavier and heavier, leading to this kind of culminate, culminating, rousing, perhaps grandstanding scene within a courtroom where our lead character is presenting these kind of idealistic message about interpretation of the law and things like that. Unsurprising to get something like that uh, in a Zhang Yimou movie these days. Given, of course, the you know pro-government lean is going to be in his movie, she's got to take that for what it is. But I do think it's a pretty thought-provoking movie. Uh, you know, state involvement aside, I think it's a pretty thought-provoking film about what it says about the right to self-defense and what excessive self-defense could mean. And the title of the film, Article Twenty, is a reference to Chinese law that is you know in on the books but very hard to uh, enforce and. Uh, rule with uh, in terms of you know legal practice so all that's to say I think there's some interesting thoughts in the film in terms of where it leads and I generally enjoyed the movie but man I thought it was long like some of it quite drags our lead character Han Ming this prosecutor is played by Li Jiayin who was also in the other big Lunar New Year movie this year YOLO but Han Ming him and his wife uh, Lee Maojun, played by Ma Li, and, and of course their son as well. But like this family, particularly th th this this uh, pr uh, spousal uh, dynamic, it starts off quite humorous. The people in my theater were certainly laughing. You know, it's hard for that comedy, of course, to translate all the way because I, of course, have to rely on reading the dub uh, and subtitle in the moment. But it starts off comedic. But I gotta say, like the bickering between you know a kind of hapless everyman husband 
and a headstrong, dedicated wife. Like, it starts off humorous, but ultimately, I, I was kind of sick of the bickering when we kept getting scene after scene of them fighting and just being completely unable to communicate with each other, despite both of them having good intentions and just completely being not on the same page and wavelength. It got a bit tiring, I have to say. And when you have that kind of dominating so much time in a movie that is really trying to say something a lot bigger and a lot grander, there's just a lot going on. There's a lot of plot points with this, including the parent's son and, you know, being involved in a uh, stopping a bully, but attacking the bully too strong. And that could affect him because he was doing the right thing, but excessively. And, of course, there's, you know, things going on. Uh, at work for uh, uh, Han and you know his his colleague Lu Ling uh, Ling, who is also his ex girlfriend. His colleague is a very idealistic one who has real genuine motivation to uh, you know uh, fix the legal system and, and and actually serve justice to people. All of that's there, right? And then at the end, they actually have our lead character who's been borderline incompetent for most of the movie, he's the one who gets to give the idealistic speech about the law, not the idealistic character who gets sidelined halfway through. There's just a lot to the movie, a lot going on with it. And I think just some of it just lands better than others. Um, I'd be curious what people who, of course, speak Mandarin think of the comedy because they probably translates a lot better to them, of course, in the native language. So I'm not really too critical of that. Uh, given my limitations watching the film. But I did think it was just kind of an overstuffed movie. And if it was a bit more focused on the at-home angle or the work angle, I just don't think either one's completely served well enough, uh, given how stuffed the movie is. It's shot in uh, Langtang in China, which was not... It's just kind of like generic like suburbs and city stuff. Like, nothing super engaging to the eye. It definitely does not hold a candle to say uh, Full River Red, which was a period film, of course, and looked fantastic, or even Under the Light, which I forget what city it took place in, but had a more urban, like, modern look to it. Article 20, you know, it, maybe it's more realistic how, how, how it's portrayed, you know, to the everyday person, but I wasn't super engaged visually with it. So yeah, in conclusion, I think Article 20, again, it presents pretty interesting, like, thoughts and takeaways in terms of the law and justice and ethics, I, I, I think all oh, that's pretty engaging. And when the movie is on that track, it's pretty interesting. But for me, a lot of the, you know, more personal character dynamic stuff was very up and down just because the movie was so overstuffed. So Zhang Yimou, I mean, remain a fan of him. I've watched many of his movies at this point, continue to review his stuff, looking forward to him continuing to work as prolifically as he is. I, I don't know what his next movie is. Nothing's been announced officially yet, but given how he's been working, I'm sure we'll get something soon. And when it does come out, I will talk about that. But let me know, how'd you feel about Article 20? Did you think it was more cohesive than I did? Let me know. And for more movie reviews, including YOLO from the Lunar New Year box office alongside Article 20. I also talked about YOLO. Check that out. But for more movie reviews, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up, welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Ariana Grande's seventh album, Eternal Sunshine. It's Ariana's first album in over three years, you know, following positions way back at the end of 2020, which of course capped the three-year run, three-album run from Ariana with Sweetener, Thank You, Next, and Positions. And of course, that run was in sync with Ariana achieving the top of pop stardom for both her celebrity, her effortless vocal range, really the best voice of her generation when it comes to pop stars, and also just really great songcraft. You know, I think knowing uh, who to work with, of course, collaborating with someone like Max Martin. That being said, Positions was the weakest of those three albums, where there was still a lot to, I think, like about that album, but it definitely felt uh, less consistent than Sweetener and Thank You Next. So, Following, you know, again, three years was a long time in pop music. And of course, Ariana has been in the uh, public eye recently, of course, following her uh, divorce from Dalton Gomez, her relationship with Ethan Slater, her co star from the upcoming Wicked film coming later this year. Ariana has been in the news and Eternal Sunshine. You know, I wasn't really sure what to expect from a from a sound 
perspective with a new album from hers after such a long layoff. And that lead single, Yes And, certainly gave us a hint of what was to come. I'm happy to say that Ariana Grande's seventh album, Eternal Sunshine, is a very impressive sonic pivot from a A-tier pop star. Ariana is not giving you the traditional sound she usually has. This is more synthy. This is more like moody, more atmospheric, but also lyrically, it's a really impressive, I think, progression from Ariana. It's less, I think, tabloid and explicit and like name dropping um, when it comes to lyrical sentiment, but it's still, I think, a really cohesive lyrical message where this is obviously a breakup album from Ariana, but it feels, I think, a lot more a lot more moody and a lot more like lived in and you can kind of like sink into this album and the sounds again with the synths with the disco vibes like it, it's definitely a change from ariana but i think it also really speaks to her talents as a vocalist that she's able to really switch up what she has been known to do again and still really deliver some great songs working with max martin on 11 of the 13 tracks here but these are not the typical like max martin big pop maximalist song you might think of you know there's no bad idea on here if we look back to thank you next which of course was a max martin song these are different but again it speaks to ariana's talent that she's able to really progress to this and i think lean into r&b even more than she ever has and she's done that before look back on yours truly some songs on positions but like this i think is a real like statement of like intent of changing the type of song she makes it's really cool and when you do get the amazing vocals from Ariana that we know she can give us. I think they actually hit really hard because you're not getting them quite as often on this album. So I, I was pretty impressed with Eternal Sunshine, really for it being an effective, engaging change from what she has done before. Notably, this is only 13 songs, 36 minutes. It's pretty brief, but I think there's a lot here in terms of uh, just in, in songs to go back to. So let's start with track two, by. Very dancey, very synth heavy, basically a disco song. I think the hook is quite catchy, the boy by part. Um, yeah, I think I think this this is probably one of the highlights of the album, one of the easiest songs to revisit. Um, I'm curious like what the hit is going to be on Eternal Sunshine, just because this album was coming out, Ariana Grande signed to Republic Records, Republic Records part of Universal Music Group. None of these Ariana Grande songs are going to be on TikTok. Obviously, Ariana Grande is way bigger than needing TikTok. To, to be successful this will be a big album a number one album obviously but i'm just curious like how those things go when the traditional mode of promotion a la tiktok is not available to her anyway i think bye definitely has some uh chance to be be a hit for sure uh don't want to break up again thought that one was pretty solid uh the title track though eternal sunshine very vibey a little more bass heavy i think verse one was quite catchy i like supernatural from Aria as well. I think True Story, another big highlight from her. Uh, the bass drums really hit again on this one, but I think like uh, sonically, her vocal pro progression really stands out. And you kind of just have one of those classic like stinger lyrics from Ari. I'll play the bad girl if you need me to. You know, again, I think just the kind of cohesion of the lyrical sentiment on this album where she doesn't name drop who she's talking about there's no song named p davidson this time but you get the vibe and it all comes across honestly it's pretty evergreen um true story it's a good one uh the next song the boy is mine shout out brandy and monica obvious reference I like this one when the beat drops about the eight second mark god damn that shit hits and i think at this point this middle to end stretch of the album uh you know, instrumental wise, beat wise, the album really picks up. I think it gets really quite engaging. And then we have, of course, Yes And, the lead single, which I actually like a lot more in the context of the album. I thought it was okay uh, as, as a single on its own when I first heard it and really just interesting from it being a sign of probably what was to come. And of course, we now know that is to be the case. But Yes And, in the context of the album, the beat almost like comes across as like super strong. It's almost like a breakbeat vibe. Uh, with this and even if i still don't love the hook vocally just not quite sticky enough the song does have good verses and a really fun remix that we just got last week featuring mariah carey of course someone aria is often compared to we can't be friends wait for your love this is another big highlight on eternal sunshine this is a great song lyrically i think it's probably the most consistent the most compelling uh thing from Ari here another like 
instant classic line from her. Honestly, you got me misunderstood. But at least I look this good. Uh, fucking bars. <laughs> uh, I wish I hated you. This is the ballad on this. There's not that many ballads, thankfully. Uh, not what I go to for Ariana, so that one didn't really stand out to me. Uh, Imperfect for you, though. I like this one quite a bit. Drum hits really nice. Like, and, like The mixing on this is quite choice, where it's hitting right on like those vocal lines from Ari. You get a little bit of subtle guitar on this one. And then Ordinary Things, the final song, has the one quote feature, but it's really just... Um, you know, words of wisdom from Ariana's grandmother. There's actually really no features on this album. So yeah, Eternal Sunshine. You know, it's been, again, three years from Ariana Grande, a eternity in pop music when you're at the top. And yet, this feels like a really put-together, compelling album. And it certainly speaks to the tabloid nature of Ariana's public life, but I think in a mature way, in a different way than she has in the past. And there's stickiness to a lot of these songs that'll make them easy to revisit, despite the fact that they are sonic change and they are not as big and maximalist as some of the bangers she's dropped in the past. So again, I, in conclusion, I'm just quite impressed with her ability to compel us in such a new way. So yeah, shout out Ariana Grande. Um, I'm looking forward to her going on tour again because I missed the Sweetener World Tour when that came out, which was a big tour. Hoping she goes on tour again. I want to see her. But yeah, let me know. How did you feel about Ariana Grande's album, Eternal Sunshine? What did you like about it? Did you appreciate all these changes? Let me know. And for more music reviews, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. All right, that's going to do it for the pod this week. Next week, I'm going to talk about my early 2025 Oscar predictions. It's always fun to take that snapshot very beginning of the year, right after the previous Oscars, and just try and figure out where we're headed from the year to come. Also, Apple TV Plus's Masters of the Air is wrapping up. Got to talk about that series. And then some new music from some high-profile people such as Justin Timberlake, Casey Musgraves, and Tierra Whack. So make sure you subscribe. YouTube.com slash NostalgiaPod. Linktree.com slash NostalgiaPod. See links below. Make sure you get the Best of 2024 Spotify playlist, my favorite songs of the year, updated every week. Let me know it's good, and I'll see you next week. Yeah.